For the second year in a row, uh, Brewbound has partnered with Nielsen to co-develop a survey aimed at better understanding consumer behavior. Last year, we took a look at health-conscious consumer purchasing behavior, and this year, we're looking at the consumer familiarity around popular beer buzzwords uh, used to market some of the brands that are on the market today. Um, I, I don't want to steal uh, Danny and Caitlin's thunder here, but uh, you know, it was a 2,000-person survey that examined about 30 popular craft beer buzzwords, uh, think descriptors like hoppy and piney and citrusy, to see what effect, if any, they had on consumer purchase decisions. And the goal really was to better understand whether or not the terms that we often see used by craft breweries in their marketing actually resonated with craft beer drinkers. So. Here to reveal the findings of that survey are Nielsen Associate Client Manager Caitlin Battaglia and Danny Bragger, the Senior Vice President of Nielsen's Beverage Alcohol Practice. Please welcome them to the stage. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, yeah, Chris and I talked uh, a little bit about trying to break down some of the craft buzzwords that are used in the industry, kind of liberally thrown around sometimes, to see whether they really resonate uh, with the consumer. Um, so this is going to be different from what you might normally expect from Nielsen, because normally we might stand up here and talk about industry sales trends, and there's certainly a lot of cool things we could talk about, but I know you've got a great panel coming up after the break to actually do that, so we'll leave that to them. So, like I said, we're not going to talk about all these things up here. Uh, things that are going on in the industry. There's a ton of juicy stories we could talk about, frankly, and we've got a pretty, you know, half-decent rounded view of the industry. Now we're measuring on-premise as well as off-premise, so we could kind of talk about all those things. But we wanted to kind of, we like when Chris challenges us to do something uh, a little bit different. So uh, we're going to try to do something a little bit different this time around. Um, so in very simplistic terms, uh, consumers can usually describe why they choose a craft beer. And, and these are actually their words. This wasn't part of this survey. This was something else where we just said to them, like, tell us what you think craft beer is. And the words here that are bigger are the ones that they more associate with craft beer. Um, so when we ask them why they choose a craft beer over a non-craft option, both were available. They'll talk about terms like better beer or quality, uh, along with taste and flavor, and then you know a little bit further down, but you'll see terms like variety and local. Um, or when we ask them to define, uh, or what's a defining factor for a beer to be considered craft, which is on the left-hand side, or what's a defining factor for a beer not to be considered craft on the right-hand side, they can pretty easily tell us, again, simplistically kind of why they think something is craft, which might be led by unique flavor or high quality is, as opposed to what's not a craft, and, and what leads that is, is being mass manufactured. But those are actually pretty easy. Uh, compared to the language of craft that really does or can get a lot deeper than that. Uh, and I guess the question we were trying to answer almost for ourselves is, in some of those words, are we kind of talking more to each other um, and it's industry speak as opposed to what, cons what might resonate with a consumer? Um, so to do that, we teamed up with Brewbound. Uh, Chris was kind enough to give us like uh, hundreds of words to, to look at. Uh, we told him like surveys, you can't kind of, kind of do 100 at a time. So we pared it down to around 30. Uh, we executed a consumer survey with our partners at Harris. We supplemented that with a bit of Nielsen survey data, a bit of Nielsen scan data. We uh, worked with another partner of ours in the Bay Area called uh, Social Standards that uh, measures what consumers talk about online, because we also wanted to kind of hear what they talk about more naturally without us asking them questions. And then we wanted to present those results to you at a, at a, at a pretty high level. So these are the words that we ended up with. Um, and I'll leave it up there for a second. There's a bunch that are kind of more industry marketing terms. There's a bunch that are more kind of product related terms. Uh, it's ordered a, a bit alphabetically, I hope, so that uh, you can maybe find a word. Uh, and it was interesting last night when uh, Dan and Thomas were introducing, I think it was the Simply Excited IPA, they actually, we were counting, Caitlin and I, they actually mentioned eight of them uh, during their introduction about what this beer was all about. Um, if I take off, off my research hat and just kind of think about myself as a consumer, I'm not a big avid reader of product labels and marketing, I guess because I do a lot of that at work, uh, so I try not to do that when, in my personal life. Uh, so I wasn't sure that some of these might be used a lot. Uh, then one of our colleagues um, who actually uh, couldn't be here today, um, but she was out at a bar uh, over the weekend and she actually sent me this label. Um, 
over the, uh, like I said, just a couple days ago, and I was kind of looking at the label, and I don't know if you can see it there, but there were nine of the 29 words that we tested that are actually on this label somewhere. All those ones on the right-hand side. So, you know, why, while I thought maybe these words aren't necessarily used a lot in marketing, I guess they, I guess they are, at least on, on some labels. To the extent, I, I guess at the end of the day, you probably care a lot more about, like, selling your product than, than words on a page. Um, so we actually wanted to look at a little bit of our information, like from our scanning database, because we code different labels so we can look at product characteristics and how some of them, how some of those products are selling. Um, and also we can look at the name of the label or the name of the brand and we code that as well. So I, want, I wanted to have Caitlin maybe just show you a little bit about, for a couple of these words, kind of how they're doing in the marketplace. So Caitlin? Uh, so citrus contains items like tangerine or grapefruit. Uh, tropical contains items like coconut or guava or passion fruit. And what we saw across all five terms is that the number of brands in the market that contain some whatever the variation of this, the terms is, they've increased in terms of offerings over the past year. Similar trend, what you would hope to see, we've also seen their sales increase um, really significantly. Citrus flavors are just doing great these days. But to understand how big they are, that's a really important piece. So several of these items are really operating off of a small base. So they have a small share of craft. But when you look at like citrus and hop, they've really managed to take hold of a decent amount of craft. And as they continue to grow, uh, we would see that perhaps they're going to continue to grab more share of craft and continue to post those really substantial growth rates or at least positive growth rates as they move forward. OK, so we survey. Uh, so what we did is we fielded a survey actually quite recently, so this is pretty new. Uh, we talked to a couple thousand adults, 21 plus, representative of the population, both geographically and demographically. Uh, we asked them about how often they drink craft beer, so we wanted to speak to the more regular craft beer drinkers. Uh, so we found uh, several hundred that uh, say they drink craft beer several times a month. Those are the people that we wanted to talk to. Uh, they self-define craft. We didn't tell them, you know, we didn't give them a definition. They sort of said uh, however they thought about craft themselves. And then we analyzed the data uh, more specifically to that group that, that drinks craft beer a lot. Uh, and basically, while well, we asked them a couple of other questions, there were two basic things that we wanted to try to understand. One is just how familiar are you with these terms? You know, are you really familiar with it? Or are you not all that familiar? And there was a four-point scale we used. And then the second thing we wanted to know is if you're aware of those terms, does it um, motivate you? Are you more likely to purchase that craft beer? Are you less likely to purchase that craft beer? Or does it not make a difference kind of one way or the other? Um, so here's uh, some of the, the data from that. Across the 29 terms, if you kind of average those 29 terms out, um, the average was about 52. So there was you know, a, almost the same percentage of people said they were aware of it that, that said they weren't across the 29 terms. Uh, the very highest term uh, said 81% of regular craft binker, drinkers said they were familiar with that term, and it happened to be independent or independently owned. Now, they might have defined that however they wanted. It could be that they thought about independent from a true ownership perspective. It could be that it didn't matter about ownership, but the brewery kind of represented themselves as being independent or independently uh, run or um, has independent roots, but that came up as the number one, followed by these four terms, traditional, hoppy, drinkable, limited edition, terms that consumers said they were very extremely, very or extremely aware of. Uh, at the very lowest end uh, was GABF. Now, we didn't spell it out, Great American Beer Festival, because we actually wanted to see if people understood just the acronym, GABF, which most people actually said they didn't really know what that meant. Uh, so I would suggest that adding Great American Beer Festival to the sponsors of that would be a good idea so that people, because otherwise people don't know what GAF, GABF means. Um, and next were Brett, Funky, Grassy, and Mosaic. So those were the terms that people were least familiar with. Um, and if you kind of splayed it out on this page, um, and all we did here was show the ranking from the very left, which is people not familiar with the term, to the very right, which is people very familiar with the term, you can see where everything else lands. And I'm sure Chris and his team will make this available to you so that you don't have to uh, write stuff down if you're looking for a term and, and where that might fall. 
Um, so those are all obviously averages. Um, that's across everyone 21 plus who drinks craft beer frequently. Uh, we wanted to take it at least one step down and kind of look at how that looks by a couple different demographic groups that we think are of interest. Uh, so first we looked at gender and we saw, perhaps not surprising, but male respondents were far more aware of the terms uh, than female respondents. Of our 29 terms, we actually had 17 terms among male respondents where there was more than a 50% awareness level. So it's a pretty substantial number of our terms. When you contrast that with female respondents, awareness was a lot lower and there was a much lower number of terms that reached the 50% the awareness level. When we tried to look at gender parity, so those items where the awareness levels among women and men, female and male respondents, was pretty equal, uh, you see that citrus is by far the term that women are the most aware of. And then the other terms, um, which would be limited edition, West Coast IPA, sour, and juicy, there's kind of a theme of women being more aware of flavor-related items, less so aware of the marketing terms or kind of the industry terms, the technical terms, more aware of the flavor terms. How is it going to taste? For me, this really resonates. If a beer has sour on it, I definitely gravitate to it. That raspberry sour beer last night was fantastic. Um, so I can say as a female craft drinker, this really resonates with me. We then looked at age groups. So again, not particularly surprising perhaps. Uh, the younger group was definitely more aware of our terms and awareness goes down um, as con respondents got older. This is great when you think about the long term. So as that 21 to 34 year old age group ages up, they'll likely carry that awareness with them. So when we look at this chart in five, 10, 15 years, uh, it'll probably look different. There'll probably be a, white, be a wider range of awareness. But today, if you're trying to capture those consumers that are on the older end of the spectrum, there's a real opportunity for education, both with women. So we know that women, if you're trying to get them more aware of technical terms, then there's an education opportunity there. And if you're trying to capture some of the older consumers, there's another education opportunity. Make them aware of the terms that are important to you, important to your beer, and important to your brewery. Okay, so that's um, on the awareness side. Just are people familiar with the term or not? The second thing was, you know, awareness is great, but unless that converts into purchase, it doesn't mean, mean a whole lot. So we wanted to find out if you know that term, so these are just the people that were familiar with the term, are you more likely to purchase that product, less likely or, or equally as likely? Um, so if we look again across the average, um, across the 29 terms, 28% they were, said they were more likely across those 29 terms versus 16% less likely. Anytime I see more likely being higher than less likely, there's a net there positive, so that's a good thing. Um, and I'll show you, obviously, how that looks for the different terms in, in a minute. But there were actually 23 of the 29 terms, once people were aware of them, said that was a positive to them. So 23 out of 29, I think that speaks well for the power of many of those terms and actually saying to people, this, you know, this is a, a good product to actually purchase. Um, so here were the top ones, and some of these are almost like, uh, says to me, like, you don't have to necessarily overthink some of the marketing. So things like drinkable, uh, independently owned or independent came up again. Traditional, limited edition. Uh, limited edition is a pretty generic marketing term, but when you have something special, you should tell your consumers about it. And West Coast IPA were the, were the top ones. On the uh, furthest to the negative, uh, there weren't actually that many, like I said. Sour was actually one of the ones that was there, um, which may sort of seem a little weird given we see these large you know, increases in sour uh, style sales. Um, so I would, I would guess that the term itself may just turn people off, and, and maybe they don't understand what the term is, but when you hear something like just generically sour or funky or something like that, that may not be you know, something that they know what it is or, or necessarily want to hear. Uh, so the challenge is probably to convert awareness, because people were aware of that, to trial so that at least consumers can try the product and then decide for themselves if they like it or not. Um, so here's how the terms look kind of from left to, to right. Again, the further to the right, the greater the likelihood that that term induces people to actually try the product, the furthest to the left, uh, not so much. But there weren't that many terms, again, on the left. Um, and a lot of these terms, everything kind of highlighted in red and blue boxes, are actually terms that people are quite aware of. So in those cases, you've got high awareness, and anything to the right um, is, a, is a strong motivator to, to purchase again. 
So one more time, I just wanted Caitlin to talk to some uh, demographic differences. Um, so before I flip, if we look at the net kind of if on this slide, which is the average slide, we can see that the net's kind of, it's going to be a plus 12. Um, when we compare that by gender, we can see that male respondents are far, their purchases are far more influenced by our list of terms, especially compared to female respondents. That's a really low level of purchase influence for female respondents. Again, looking to that gender parity, where do we find terms where uh, the purchase influence is pretty equal between male and female respondents? You're seeing a lot of the same terms of what you saw in awareness. Once again, there's this theme of female respondents being more influenced in terms of their purchases by terms that are more related to the flavor of the beer. Again, not so much the marketing or the technical terms. Um, you do see things like limited edition in New England style, but drinkable, tropical, citrus, citrusy, that citrus idea is coming up again, really resonate with the female drinkers. So we, um, there was a couple of other things that actually weren't part of this survey, but we've done kind of recently. Uh, so I thought we'd kind of show those as well, because these are obviously terms that are uh, quite uh, uh, apparent in the industry as well and, and used quite a lot. So one is sessionable. Um, so we asked consumers, are you familiar with that term or not? And I was actually surprised, maybe you're not, I'm not sure, again, amongst regular drinkers, that 57% of regular drinkers never even heard of the term. So you might think that everyone knows about it, but apparently there's a large percentage that don't know about it, number one. Then secondly, about seven, and that's 57% have never heard of it. Another 17% have heard of it, but they're not familiar with it, so they don't really know what it means. Uh, then there's 12% uh, that are only somewhat familiar with it, and there's really only leaves about 12% of people who really get it. So when you say session or sessionable, they know, what it, you know, they, they know about it and they know what it means. Um, at the same time, there's actually quite a large percentage of people who understand and they pay attention to the alcohol content. So they get that part, they just aren't translating that into the term session or sessionable. And if you ask them, they can tell you exactly you know, what is the ideal ABV for them? Because we did that as well. We said, you know, what is the ideal ABV for yourself? Um, and the sweet spot seems to be around that 4 to 6% range, because that's where you get 26%, 32%. Not that there aren't people who like, you know, everything from the very light uh, to, to, the, uh, to the bigger AV, ABVs, but again, the middle is where most of the consumers say that uh, that's what they're looking for. Um, the other term, which obviously you know, was used a lot, is local. Um, so we asked people in this question, how important is local to you? And among craft beer drinkers, 75% uh, of people that drink craft beer weekly say that it's important to them, with almost one-third saying it's essential or very likely. So that term definitely means something, something. If you ask them a little bit more, like, tell me exactly what local means to you, you'll get all sorts of different things. Sometimes it's within my county or neighborhood. Sometimes it's just within my state. So how people interpret local differs, but local itself is certainly something that people are aware of and, and resonates. So one last view, and that's in the social media space. Um, so we, you know, this was all about when we ask consumers, you know, tell us, are you aware of the term? Does it motivate you to purchase? That's what that was. We also wanted to you know, understand just what people talk about. Um, and so we did that in conjunction with a company out of the Bay Area called Social Standards who unobtrusively, obviously, listened to all the conversations and try to make sense out of them. They built a platform um, built uh, today on Instagram and Twitter conversations. They have over, uh, I think, a billion adult beverage conversations. They built a platform specifically for the beer as well as wines and spirits industry, so we can kind of look at conversations at a very granular level and then roll it up. And we can look at how much people talk about brands, what they say about brands, and also what else are in the conversations with those brands. So what else are they talking about uh, at, at the same time as they may or may not be talking about a specific brand. Uh, and they do that for all of your brands and for all of, you know, for all the other brands in the industry. Um, and we know that people talk a lot about craft beer, right? Um, in fact, over 20% of all the beer conversations are craft beer conversations. That 21%, that's several share points higher than craft beer share of beer sales. So people who, people who uh, drink craft beer also talk about craft beer a fair bit. So before we look at the specific terms and what uh, the, the 29 terms and what people are saying or how much people are talking about those, uh, we wanted to show you, first of all, what craft brands 
consumers talk about the most, and this will be on a national basis. We can also sort of look at it down to a local market level, um, but I'm going to have Caitlin sort of talk through that piece. So as Danny mentioned, craft is capturing a lot of conversations in the social media space. So we wanted to look at brands because that's something people are pretty familiar with. So these are the top 12 brands, again, among Twitter and uh, Instagram conversations. These are the top 12 mentions. So uh, starting with Stone and going all the way down to Sierra Nevada. We also looked at the percentage of these conversations that had an overtly positive or favorable message. And those are indicated by the stars. So you can see what are the brands that are having the most conversations, and then where do we see a higher percentage of favorable or positive conversations. To give this a little more context, we wanted to compare their, the, each of these brands, the same list of brands, their share of social, social media conversations to their share of craft beer sales. So what we can see is there are several brands that are being over-mentioned on social media. So they're capturing more, a larger share of social media than they, would, they have in terms of sales in uh, the market space. What this means is they have a sense of social weight. They're engaging with consumers. Clearly, social media is doing well for them as they're an, engaging at a level that's higher and outstripping their market sales. So circling back to our terms, when we looked at our list of 29 terms, in terms of what's being talked about on Instagram and Twitter, we saw that hoppy and sour were by and away the two terms that were mentioned the most frequently. Uh, you can also see then that's followed by barrel-aged, juicy, and citrus. We then looked at the terms that were, again, the most favorably or positively mentioned, had the highest percentage of uh, favorable posts. You see a different mix of terms when you look at this cut. So citrus appears on this list again, but you're seeing items that are related to the drinking experience. So I had a really great time drinking this balanced beer that I was drinking, or um, I'm talking about the beer that I'm drinking that's a collaboration opportunity, or it's a limited edition beer. So when you look at, um, there's just a different sense of the terms that are being mentioned the most frequently and the terms that are being mentioned in a favorable or positive light. So I'm going to turn it back over to Danny, who is going to take us home with key takeaways. OK, so just one last slide um, before Chris pummels us with probably a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, I started off by saying, or at least the, posing the questions, do we just talk to ourselves some, uh, within the industry? And I guess the answer is sometimes we do. I mean, there are some terms that we just throw out there, and they're not resonating with consumers. There's a lot of other ones that do resonate. Um, when we do get that awareness, we do tend to see some pretty good purchase positive motivators. So that part's good. The awareness levels, sort of, they, they definitely range. Um, and I think to me, it, it, it comes back to knowing your consumer, which I think Dan said really well, like you really need to know the, the, your consumer. Not every craft beer drinker for every brand is a craft expert. Uh, so some terms may not just resonate. It may not really be worth the marketing effort around it. Others may may deserve that um, reinforcement, and it requires continual education or refinement of the message around the term. Like I said, post-awareness, most of the terms have a positive purchase influence, so that was, that was a good thing. Um, where you have a term that, where people are motivated to buy it, but awareness levels are low, those are the ones that you really want to try to do that education around, because once people know about it, that tends to be a positive. Uh, there's certainly still a significant gender and age gap to overcome that, that Caitlin had talked about, and I think that's one just generally for the industry that's important to both recognize and address, uh, so we're not always just talking to a white, millennial, upper-income uh, male, because um, if we want to broaden the tent, we've really got to go beyond that. Um, fourthly, leverage both social media space. People talk a lot about craft online, as well as taproom tasting visit festivals, all those kinds of things uh, for part of your marketing and education program about craft and the language of craft. And then really like prioritize what's important to you to communicate. Like when I saw that label, that one that I showed, it, it seems to me that's kind of overwhelming. And the message, the key message or two that you want to get across may get lost in the plethora of terms that are just kind of thrown on, on a page, and that's probably not a good thing. Uh, so, you know, the net-net is sometimes less is more. So with that, uh, thank you for your time. Chris, thanks for having us do this, and I'll turn it back to you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, guys. For those of you who were at the welcome reception last night, we, uh, we had the super excited 
session IPA. I mean, <laughs> they played right into my if hands. If you guys ever good. build a brewery, we can do buzzword souffle. That can be the name of uh, the, our beer collaboration. Um, so we only got a couple minutes, and uh, there are a couple audience questions. But um, you know, the, there's a lot of information to kind of download in in these presentations. And uh, you know, I guess sort of. My big question is for you guys, you guys look at data all the time, you guys are uh, far more adept at analyzing this stuff than I am. What was the most surprising takeaway and the least surprising takeaway for you guys? Um, so let me tackle the first part, maybe Caitlin has a thought about the second part. I, I guess the most surprising is that um, sometimes some just generic marketing terms, they, they still work. So limited edition, innovative, I mean those things aren't any more specific to craft beer than they would be to cookies, crackers, ice cream, or anything else. Uh, so when you really have products that are innovative or it's a special edition or whatever, you use them because those work, consumers kind of get them, they're not craft speak. Um, so that's, drinkable is another one, I guess, that, you know, I mean, why shouldn't everything be drinkable? But consumers kind of like to be told that this is a drinkable product. Um, the, the one that, uh, I guess, sessionability being that low, like the number is really like 60% don't even, they don't even heard of the term and most of the others don't know what it means. That surprised me a bit. Um, and then that, I mean, and I won't get into the debate about independent and independently owned, but consumers, they know something about it because um, that was kind of the number one term for, for awareness. Now, how they interpret that, that's, you know, in their own mind, but that's on the most surprising side. I'd say on the least surprising side, Hoppy, the fact that there was so much awareness around hoppy, probably not overly surprising. And then that local is so important to craft beer drinkers. But with local, it's so important to keep in mind that my definition of local could be different than Danny's definition of local. There really is a lot of variation in the way people are defining local, but it's still important at the core um, among craft beer drinkers. Yeah, for me, what I found really interesting was that um, consumers were not really familiar with the terms hazy or juicy. Uh, which are two characteristics of New England style IPAs, and yet they were very familiar with the term New England, uh, New England style. So, it is, does that suggest anything to you? Like, what's what's sort of the takeaway there that you kind of have a polarizing effect in some way? Uh, well, I think it's a good thing. Brands have done a really good job of. Uh, driving awareness around what, like New England style IPA, people are aware of it, that's a good thing. Awareness is not a bad thing. It kind of goes back to the idea of don't overwhelm and don't get too caught up in the technical. Um, is an awareness of hazy or juicy really important to driving purchase influence? There's not, a, our survey would say probably not, but um, the fact that there is awareness around the New, New England style IPA, that's a really good, important thing to focus on because at the end of the day, people are aware of um, that style and brands have done a good job of driving that awareness. Yeah, and one of the audience questions that we received was just a question about geography. Um, you know, where were these respondents based? Is it, uh, you know, a, a pretty accurate assessment or is it skewed East Coast, West Coast? So we did the survey nationally, so it's representative, you know, the, the 2,000 came from a balance, so when Gallup does their thing of 1,000, they do it them, geographically, we do our thing with through Harris, geographically representative. We actually have data for four or five different cuts of geography that we can provide, because there could be some differences west versus northeast, for instance, and a couple of the other regions. Sure. Um, well, I guess now that uh, we've analyzed health conscious consumer behavior and, and beer buzzwords, <laughs> what are we going to do next you're, year, Danny? You're killing us. We just <laughs> did this one. Like, give, me a, give me a day to think about it. Um, so, so the one thing that I, I got to thank every time I speak at a conference, I always thank the people in the audience because this industry always gives you something new and different to talk about. I can't, who, I don't even know like six, seven months from now what's going to be new and different. <laughs> um, but I'm sure there will be and we can have fun with that. Uh, so I would just add two things. One is, I would, like, we always tend to, on behalf of clients and everything, we tend to survey regular drinkers of that product or, or that category. You know, with slowing growth and everything, I think it's, like, going to be even more important. Like, we need to broaden that and talk to people that don't tend to drink craft beer a lot and why they're not or why they're drinking imports, not us, to, to try to get at those audiences and understand them better. Um, so that's, that's something that I'd love to do. And then um, I, we'd love to hear from you, know, you guys, you guys, like tell us what's important to you and we'd love to do some work around it. Awesome, thank you guys. Cool, Danny, thanks Chris. Caitlin, round of applause for these guys.
Enjoy.